today I want to show um, just a few of the ways I work personally and professionally and how I interview Gravity Sketch in, in all the ways I work and then touch on a few things just about VR and AI and stuff like that. So I titled this Armatures just because I love the idea of thinking of everything as an armature or like a placeholder. Um, it helps me not overthink whatever step of the process I'm in. Um, for example, if I'm doodling or making a 3D model, I make it as crude and as um, janky as possible um, so that I'm not spending as much time, but I'm still communicating the, the intent. Um, and I'm also, I'm also a big process nerd, and I love all the byproducts that you create in a design process. So the clay model armatures themselves, to me, are pretty beautiful, even though they're you know, piles of wood and foam. I, I think that stuff's really interesting. Um, the way I work really started in school. Um, about halfway through school, I got really bored with cars because it was just it's one big shape and you can put a lot of finesse into it and they're very expressive, but I wanted to do more. So I switched over to the power sports, motorcycle, mobility route. Um, and I had some great teachers along the way. Um, one of the things I had to do was ditch Alias, though, because Alias wasn't allowing me to model the things that I needed to model fast enough. Um, and I wasn't able to make the physical projects for presentations that we used to do back then. I don't think they do it this, these days. Um, but what that really did was it allowed me to uh, learn to use polygon modeling um, and to use it as a project management tool more than just a modeling tool. Um, so I understand that with polygon modeling, all the surfaces are really janky and gross, um, but they're there. And it's really easy to compose uh, a lot of components in a design to it that way. Um, so after school, I contracted with Piaggio Advanced Design Center in Pasadena. And I was really happy to see that they used the same exact workflow where it was, but it, instead of Maya, it was Cinema 4D. So we use Cinema 4D to compose our motorcycles. We use it to talk to each other and we use it to communicate with engineers in Italy. Um, that was a really cool workflow. It allowed a, a team of just me and Miguel Galizzi to pretty much create enough content to justify having a studio there. Um, it was a really fun workflow. Um, now I'm at Polaris Industries, I'm doing off-road vehicles. Uh, and I'm very lucky in that I get to work on as much as I want to work on, and I'm trusted to work the way that I want to work. Um, so I definitely take on as much as I can. Um, and I definitely use a ton of polygon modeling. Um, and now, now I use a lot of gravity sketch modeling because we, we had that introduced to our studio about a year ago, and we're starting to, to weave it into our process. Um, but I, I'm starting to use gravity more as a modeling tool, and then um, something like Blender or Cinema 4D as an organizational tool. And how I use it at work is I make this giant armature that contains all the information of a project, um, all the engineering data, all the clay scans, any of my gravity sketch models, um, any of my Blender models. I put it all together so I can do two things, which is um, organize my own thoughts so I don't have to have them up in my head and forget them. And it also lets me communicate with almost anybody um, in the organization instantly with photoreal renderings. For example, if somebody asks to see this razor with the lower cage um, or a different fascia, I could hit render, takes a few minutes, then bring it into Photoshop and make the change and show them what it looks like. Um, or I could just remodel it in Blender. I think my roll cage would take a few minutes because it's just tubes, and then give them a bunch of photoreal um, views. So it, it really lets me communicate instantly and effectively. Um, and over the course of developing a, like an off-road vehicle, it's two to three years and thousands and thousands of images and decisions we have to make. So this helps me stay on top of everything um, and keep it all within a 40-hour work week. I don't, I don't work late nights. That's for, that's for the fun stuff. Uh, so that's, that's generally how I work. And then this is a flow chart that kind of shows my influence through, uh, through the organization from just myself in the top left corner, working with sketching and gravity sketch, feeding it into Blender, and then using that to reach all these groups of people. Um, from there, I can make focus group images. I can send files to the clay mill, make images for designers to see, make renderings for leadership, um, make stuff for CMF team to use. And then I could um, work back and forth with the engineering master model to make sure everything's driving well. 
So it's something, it's the way I've been working for about four years. Oh, and then the best part is once the project is done, I, I put the file away. And then if we have to do a facelift or the next version of the project, I just bring it back with all the history and CAD data in there. And I can get I can immediately start working on the next project. Um, so at, at nights, I like to explore um, like the fun side of design just on my own. Um, I like to explore like the blue sky side of things. Um, just do all the things that I didn't get to do during the day. Um, and I, I experiment with a bunch of different things. I use a bunch of weird apps on iPads, or um, I'll just play with brush pens, or um, just do Blender node, uh, node based modeling just for fun. Um, but my favorite workflow now is just to use uh, Gravity Sketch straight up. Um, and what I like about it is it really lets you show off the creation part of the process, whether it's um, sharing screenshots of what you're working on, or like a process video of how you're building something. Or, the, or just the typical way of putting it in the blender and rendering it out. Um, it's it's a really cool way to just create a massive amount of content with such a just a really rough model. And it lets me show kind of what's in my head more than like ever, ever before. So just from one mo just from one model, I get all this content. You, know, you have the line drawing versions. Um, you have just the rough gravity sketch versions, and then contrasted with the the rendered Blender versions. And then finally, that bottom middle image is like a mixture of VR, Blender, AI, Photoshop, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, it's really, it's, this whole this whole workflow is like my favorite way to work at home now. Um, this just shows how rough I like to be with models. I, I like I said, treat them as armatures. It's just, they're just placeholders. I don't like to finish them because you, you get past that point of diminishing return um, almost immediately when you start going into little nitty gritty radii and fluids. Um, so I like to keep it rough, keep it first read, deep to first read only. Because in, in the end, I just want to create an image that shows what this vehicle could be, get people excited. I don't want to put this into production. It's just, this is just a VizCon activity for me. Um, so that shows how rough I can be with the, with the modeling. You can still go into Blender and tweak things uh, here and there if you want, uh, as long as you don't spend too much time on it. Um, so this is a project that I do every single year for myself uh, ever since 2018. It's a manned quadricopter or a tricopter, depending on how you see it. Um, and I, I do it just to gauge uh, my growth over the years, and I do it to try new processes in it. So this year, with Gravity Sketch being such a big part of my professional life um, that I've tried out personally. Um, and then all the stuff I learned here actually fed back into work. But um, I, I tried the hidden line technique that I saw on Instagram, and I instantly fell in love with it because you can you can almost fake so much 3D so fast. Um, this sketch page was done over a lunch break, and I could have included way more views, but just try to keep it simple. Um, well, what's cool about the hidden line technique is you can get all the essence and excitement from the sketch because you can use line weights. Um, you can have, you can color it in with really rough, really rough surfaces that um, don't, don't their topology doesn't really matter, and then you can have that spill over the lines or come outside the lines. And it, it really, to me, just feels like a, it feels like a Photoshop sketch in the end, but it has so much more use. And actually, you can at work. I've had, I've done projects where I've done this hidden line technique and sent it to our Blender modeler, and he turned it into a really nice millable model. Um, also, you can also take these sketches um, and then sketch over them in Photoshop and work in like a nonlinear way where it branches off into other tangents. So it's, it's totally free and open to work however you want with this technique. I love it. Um, and then this is, this is two weeks of lunch breaks just making these quadricopters and tricopters. Um, I can keep going on and on and on because it's so easy to create in that space. Um, it's very, very rewarding to sit back and see how much work you created and without, without really breaking the sweat. Um, this, this slide is a comparison showing like my, my modeling progress over time. Um, back in 2020, 
I used to spend a lot of time in Cinema 4D fully modeling things out. Um, and then 2021, I got Gravity Sketch and then started getting used to that. That was a, it's kind of a steep learning curve because I wasn't used to having so having things around me. I was so used to working on screens and paper. Um, and just that gestural model in the center is the most I could possibly think of in, in about two hours. And then this, this model on the far right is something I did the other day in one sitting and it was easy and effortless. And it has, what really struck me is it has the same impact as the model all the way to the left, but it was done in half a day. Um, so it was really cool to see the progression over time. Um, now I want to talk about AI a little bit. I'm not that um, good at AI and I'm not really good with prompts, um, but I definitely wanted to give it a try. Up in the top left, there's some pieces that I did in 2018 where I, I tried to draw like a motorcycle in an environment. And my, my goal was to um, try and make a motocross track look like a North Shore mountain bike track and how that would look with motorcycles on it. And, Maybe think of some of the challenges, like it should probably be a little bit wider, a little bit tougher looking, not, not so handmade looking. Um, and I, I spent about 10 hours on each of these views. And I had a lot of fun at the time. I was very motivated because I loved the idea. Um, but it, it did take a little bit of effort to stay up really late getting them done. Um, and that's something I, re I really, really wish I had time for today. But thanks to AI and VR, I do. Um, so on the bottom right, you can see these other images I did, 12 hours for all three of them total. And that includes the, the gravity sketch modeling, the rendering, the mid journey experiments and iterations, and then finally putting it on Photoshop. So 30 hours versus eight hours is, is pretty dramatic to me. I'm definitely enjoying doing this over and over and I don't get tired of it. Um, and then this has just been my 2022, having this workflow. Uh, it's been pretty explosive. I haven't been able to make this much work before in the past. Uh, and I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. I love how I can share more of my work with my friends and family, because um, I can't show my work stuff because of NDA. Um, but this allows me to create so much more so I can share more of myself with people. That's, that's really what I like doing. I like connecting with people over art. And now I have just the ability to connect even, even more with people. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about just what VR has been like for the last year. Um, I consider myself a power user. I've been in VR every single day a lot, and it's really changed the way I think about 3D um, in a good way. Um, it's also been a very humbling experience because when you're given a tool like Gravity Sketch that could create um, as fast as you could think, um, you realize you're not as fast and as cool as you thought you were. So um, uh, that was kind of an eye-opening experience. And then over the year, I've been focusing on how I can get 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 to be as fast as I want. And I think I'm getting there. It's very um, it's very exciting. It's also made me look at um, like clay models at work, like physical clay models, differently. And that's because we've been that's because I've been trained to create on the screen or paper. And there's just a different, there's just a different way you look at things. I didn't have the experience in school and in my training to look at real things. Um, it was always on screens. So now when I'm now when I'm looking at my clay model at work, um, I know exactly what needs to happen and how to make it happen. Whereas when I did my first clay model, full first full size clay model four years ago, I was kind of confused that you know it wasn't on the screen. So I don't know what to do. But luckily, my team helped me out. It, it went great. Um, I think it would be great if students all had headsets and started to get used to seeing things in real life, because what we make is a real life product. Um, <clears throat> I also had another realization that screens and paper are not 2D, that they're actually 3D, because they're not orthographically projected into our brains. So we still have to trying to make them with our eyes. Um, and then we have to think about what's being represented on that screen or paper. So it really feels like after working in VR for so long and then going back to 2D sketching, it really feels like I'm doing double the work. And I really think it's because of we're trying to triangulate two things at once. 
And then, then I also realized, like, oh, that's why ellipses are always off. Maybe. <laughs> Feel free to disagree. I'd love to talk with people about this, because um, it's, it's just never really thought about it before. Um, and I also feel like all the all the mental strain that I'm not doing trying to work in 2D, I'm able to apply to a project. And I made this little graphic that shows how much information you create over a project for a project over time. And the time you spend making a single 2D rendering, you could through Gravity Sketch and Blender, you can make three or more views and have an asset left over. And that all could be transferred. Um, to somebody else in an organization, or it could be shared um, on Instagram or or whatever, or just stuffed away in a library. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. These are just things that I've been thinking about as I've been going through this process. Um, that that concludes the PowerPoint part of this. Next, I want to go into like a just a gravity sketch demo and show you guys the models and show you how I work with them and how loose I am with them. So. Bear with me. I'm going to get all set up here, and I think Jaron or Ali is going to share for me. All right, so this is this is the workflow that I generally have in Gravity. Um, I start with a package exploration over on the right here, or on the left here, um, and then from there I go to the hidden line technique, um, and then or, or I go straight to just a fully uh, modeled out model, and and I can also build off of that hidden line technique if I want to. Um, and sometimes I don't even do a package. I just go straight to the to the fully modeled version just because it's so much fun and it's so easy. Um, and then once you have all that done, you can show it to a friend. Like this is my friend Greg, um, his feedback from a collab we did a few days ago. Um, really powerful just to be able to share that space. And I've jumped into his rooms and um, critiques his stuff as well. Um, I'm just going to go through really quickly like how I how I package things out, maybe do a little bit of sketching on the hidden line part, and then um, finally with the render, the fully modeled stuff. Um, so with this project, it's electric, and it's and it flies like a drone. So there's all these basic components electric vehicles have: motor, um, battery, inverter, controller. Um, and what I do is I just generally put them around or start packaging out the vehicle, um, thinking about things that are logical. Um, if the wind is going this way, I want to put all the bulky components um, out of the way so it doesn't make drag. Um, if, if you want to accelerate, if you want to accelerate at that angle for the with the least amount of effort, you should probably put the propellers perpendicular to that to that axis. Um, maybe spin them a little bit to see if they're going to chop your feet off or not. Uh, put some, indicate some motors, where the motors would go. Um, and then once I get all the basic components done, I think about, okay, we need wiring to the inverters. There's three motors, so there's probably be three inverters. Put all the wiring, wiring in there. And then from there, I start thinking about what themes um, will start to work with this package. So I want to I want to I want to connect the the front rotors to the to the person. Um, maybe make it a front, give it a front forward heavy kind of design. So I'll start to like block in a like a wing shape or something. I also want to like protect their arms just in case the air is the air is full of shrapnel from exploding drones and stuff. So maybe make it feel a little protected that way. Um, just being just being rough with it, maybe zooming out, looking looking at what it's gonna look like from a distance from the side. Um, probably gonna wanna have some kind of tail structure um, that clears the rotors. Maybe it comes up and protects your head from exploding rotors. Um, and then maybe some triangulation in the front. Um, always adjusting the package just a little bit here and there. Maybe there's some triangulation in the front for rigidity. Um, maybe I go into like thinking about what the controls are going to be. 
going to be very much like a video game controller, I imagine, but a little bit beefier, maybe something that doesn't even move so you can use it to brace yourself. Um, maybe some kind of little fender, motorcycle fender for the front. I don't know. I just, just start thinking roughly like that and not spend too much time with it. Um, and then next, when I get when I get all those lines put in place, I ghost them out like here. Um, and then I start putting nice lines in. Um, I start taking those themes that I had, like protecting the arm. Um, kind of blacking in the outline of the swing shape. Like so. Um, the cool, cool thing about gravity is you don't have to sketch lines over and over again. You could just keep dragging. Oops, you could just keep dragging your favorite lines. So you want to indicate a surface break there, a surface break there, surface break there. Tighten up some of these corners. Zoom out, see how it looks. Put more taper here. Um, start doing some thick and thin, just to, just to put some weighting into the line work. And then from there, I like to color it in. When I color it in, I say that in quotes, but like I just take a simple surface with no shading at all. Um, and then I just start placing it and color, essentially coloring in. It's like really expensive crayons, I guess. And, and this skill set that I'm using right now, it kind of builds on my knowledge of polygon modeling over the years, but anybody anybody can really do this. Um, I'm just taking edges and extruding them, basically. Like so. And then for the, for the gray parts, I would draw, draw the tail. So I just take one of these lines Start drawing in like a, a backbone type structure and then coloring it in. Um, and then you just keep going and going until you get to this level. Um, it takes about an hour and it really helps if you have music to go along with it and not dead silence like I have right now. Um, other things you could do while you're in this phase, you could take I make all these pre-made lines just so I can take them and start, you know, squirting them in there. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time drawing out each individual detail. So I take all these things and just apply them there, there. Uh, maybe get a swoosh down here. Um, and then you can also color in with like the with the volume tool just. Um, also opaque, no shading, just to really work on the silhouette of the vehicle um, without spending too much time doing surfacing. So all, all these gray shapes are just blending together into one, one form, really. Um, this is obviously a rushed version, but yeah, that's that's how that's how I got to got to up here. Um, it's, it's a really rewarding process because you can sit here and rotate it and it'll make it look good in every view. You kind of have to think about what, what views you're going to export um, in the end. Like I knew I was going to go side view. I knew I was going to do a side tip up, maybe a front three quarter, um, definitely from the bottom. So I make I try to make everything look good um, from those particular angles, which makes you kind of have to decide where you want to put where you want to put the lines on the edges. Um, but it doesn't take long to figure out. Um, and then the other way, the other way to do things kind of uses some of the skills from the hidden line technique, um, but just tries to make uh, just tries to make surfaces a little bit nicer, but without spending too much effort. So uh, I'll just show you the topology. So the, top the topology of this main piece is 
I, I did it in like the quad technique or like the, the sub D technique that you would do in any polygon software just so that I can put it in Blender or anything later and edit it. Um, but there's also a mixture of like volumes mixed in. So this is the volume tool and it's just crudely intersecting something that I nicely modeled in sub D. Um, and that's just to save time. I didn't want to, I didn't want to cut the shape out of the other shape. Um, and spend all that time. And I know in, in Photoshop, I'm just going to put a brush stroke where that fillet would be and call it a day. And all these other forms are just really crude um, intersections uh, mixed with a few nice of these. And then I'll do things like indicate um, indicate like heat sinks by throwing a bunch of lines over a shape. Um, and then I can, then it's really easy to like detail models out, especially with these power cables. These are just single brush strokes. Uh, and I also do other things like add these extra details. And this is this kind of reminds me of something I would do in Photoshop, where uh, if you have a dark space, it's all shadowed, but you want to indicate some detail, you just squiggle some stuff in there, and it looks done. Like it, from the first three point of view, you can't really tell, but it feels complete down there. So it's details that are felt and not seen. I think gravity is really good at that. Um, what else? I definitely use a, I definitely love the mannequin that's in here. Um, it's really easy to pose. And you can even pose all the joints individually. Uh, I like I like seeing how my mannequins fit. And I like and I like sitting where the mannequins are too. So you can see how this thing's gonna feel and I get a sense of what it'll be like. Do I feel safe in here? Do I feel like I'm gonna get shred to shred to pieces? I guess so. <laughs> the canopy it kind of works. Um, so there's that, and yeah, um, building building the a cleaner model is pretty easy. Um, you just treat it like a polygon model. If you if you know polygon modeling, it really helps. But if you don't, um, it's really easy to learn. If you're coming from Alias, I think it's a little bit harder, um, just because you're used to overbuilding and intersecting, whereas whereas in this you're you're intersecting. You're almost building the intersections first, which is it's kind of interesting. I've gotten totally used to it. It doesn't doesn't bother me at all. Um, but I but I do notice a speed difference between trying to do this in Gravity versus Blender. It's a lot easier to do it in Gravity. Um, it's kind of like when Procreate came out, and all of a sudden you have all these gestures to use instead of keystrokes. Um, that really helps speed things up. Procreate's a really fun. Really fun software to use. So if I had to compare it to anything, I would compare it to Procreate. Um, so you just do it the same way you build. Um, I don't like to use the creasing tool. There is a creasing tool where you crease your edges, um, but it it wherever the crease stops, that's kind of an uncontrolled way of handling it. So I like to use the proximity loop technique, where you just throw in a few extra loops, um, and then when you turn the polys on. You can get a more controlled edge. You can even have the, you know, radius grow or shrink. Um, so that's, that's basically how I build everything. And that's, and I really just wanted to show you guys how rough the model is. Um, I don't thicken anything. This is this one piece is like a, it's just a shell, and then all this junk on the inside is just filler pieces, like filler filler pieces using the the volume tool. Um, to get to get the feeling of completeness, it's not it's not worth like building building in the backside because you're only going to see it from this angle or from from this far away. You're never going to like want to zoom in and see all the details. So yeah, that that pretty much concludes my whole my whole process really. Um, if, anyone, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear from them. Um, and if Daniela, you can come back on stage. That'd be great. Thank you, Michael. This was an, a great presentation. Really good to see all of the. Well, good to 
Well, it's good to hear what you're doing on your professional life and good to see what you're doing in your personal life, um, which I imagine, you know, there's a mix of everything in there. I know there's you guys at Gravity have an MBA and you guys have seen it all. But I wish <laughs> I could share it with the rest. <laughs> um, there's so many good questions um, and a lot of comments. Um, yeah, you're blowing people's minds up with your demo. All right. So... I mean, the first question that I have for you, Michael, is I think something really important that you mentioned is like that you're really using this as a as not a, a not not like a perfect model, not something that it's for production, but it's more kind of like something that for you to bring your ideas out. So I wonder how you're using this to speed up, or how has this impacted the way that you communicate with all the different people within. Um, within Polaris, for example? Um, so I really think that data is, the, the more data you can give somebody, the better. Um, our, our job as designers is to create information, um, whether it's images or models or whatever. Um, just the other day, I had to get an, an instrument panel milled into a clay model, and I only had three hours to do it. Um, so I just immediately jumped in gravity and and banged it out, and um, it was that same model. I was able to like hand over the engineering to look at it, and I was able to get it in the clay model, and all the designers could look at it. So it was like a, I don't, I don't know, I could be with the clay model. I couldn't have done that in three hours, you know. So hope that answers your question. It does. It does. Um, so I'll start reading some of the questions, and then we'll invite Ali, our guest. Uh, for the Q&A. What is the workflow between the master engineering model and gravity sketch? Do you rely on an engineer to translate your surfacing into a parametric software? No, so I do everything through Blender. If, if I don't give any gravity sketch files to engineers, I put it in Blender first, turn it into like a OBJ and kind of clean up the file, organize it, and then send it, send it to them as, a, as an STL something. But if I'm getting engineering data, um, I'll take it as form as in the form of like an STP, bring it in the blender, save it out as an OBJ, um, import it into gravity sketch, doodle over it, and then go back and forth that way. So blender is like the intermediary between it all. Um, do you import the blades from CAD software or do you use gravity sketch? Um, Those are gravity. There's a polar symmetry tool, and those were just um, volume the volume tool with polar symmetry. And then you, you group it all, and then you can move it around. Could you tell us about your thoughts regarding the accuracy of the model? Blender and Gravity Sketch don't use metric unit, units, right? Also, how do you prep for 3D printing? Good questions. Um, what was the first part? Blender doesn't or does not use metric units. It says that Gravity Sketch and, and Blender do not use metric units, right? I, I really struggle with scaling in Blender. For some reason, you have to you have to set the scene scale to something crazy to get imports and exports to work. So I'm still working on that. I will get back to you guys on that. Um, <laughs> what, what was the second part? <laughs> and how do you prep for three D printing? So for 3D printing, um, I just use the solidify mod solidify modifier in Blender. Um, it's really easy to work with gravity sketch models because they're polygonal, and polygonal models are um, they're all they're all watertight most of the time. So it's really easy to just apply the solidify, and that thickens it, and then you're ready to go. Um, some tips for hard surfacing. Hmm. I would say, I mean, start start with big proportions, add your prox or um, then decimate it, and then cut out cut out the details from it. Um, and one one way I like to work is I like to just make a bunch of. Or another another way to work is like I make a bunch of um, just single quads that are unsmoothed, and then I'll intersect all the quads. Um, as if I were working an alias, and then I'll use the knife tool to cut the edges of the quads so that they all meet up and then merge all the vertices. 
um, that lets you get really, really interesting farms that are hard to get just by um, extruding polygon edges. I um, hope that makes sense. I'm gonna I'm gonna be in a, a virtual table after this, or at the end of the day, so I can just demo some of this stuff. Uh, which <laughs> this is a good question. Which tutorial do you recommend for a first time gravity sketch beginner? <laughs> I, I recommend just going in a collab room with somebody. The cool thing about collab rooms is you can look over their shoulder and see what menus they're using. And you can literally point to the menu like, say, no, 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 it's this one or that one. Um, so it's it's one of the easiest things to teach people. I, I teach my coworkers all the time. Um, and it's one of the easiest things to learn, too. You can learn it in a few days. Um, yeah, it's essentially a, like a, a really lightweight software. It's, you can probably learn it on a phone, which is, which a headset is essentially a phone. Um, let's talk this term, in terms of processing power. So. And you mentioned that you're not, I mean, that you're not doing too much, that you were doing first kind of like a lot of drawing and using some iPad um, applications and so on, and then jumping into Gravity Sketch. And then you little by little stopped <laughs> that process and started going straight away into 3D. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of crazy for an art center graduate, right? That has been kind of like put through the like through yeah. the pain of training. Maybe I'm ready to never sketch again. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, in Art Center, I spent many nights, many all-nighters just sketching things out. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily the best workflow for everything. There, there are times when sketching is way faster. Like if you have no idea what you're going to do, um, I always, if, if I have no idea what I'm going to do, I'm going to sketch it on paper or do a little napkin doodle and then go into gravity pretty soon. Um, or is it, if I just want to do something in an illustration style or I want to draw something like an environment or something that's not an industrial shape, definitely 2D. Um, or if I just want to do a single view of a vehicle, I don't want to go through the whole process of modeling and rendering, um, still 2D. So there's a place for it. It's still fun. Um, it's just not fun to like, have a huge deliverable to and have to like figure it out to be. So. Yeah. And do you think that, I mean, there's this, like this whole week we have been having this conversation around like, is it still important to train on like perspective drawing and sketching and, you know, oh, like absolutely. making sure that you nail that. But I'm, I'm curious to hear, cause yeah, of course it's important, but what's the important bit of it? And I can tell you my, perspective and I think the important part is when you're learning how to sketch when or perspective draw because sketch can be 3D now <laughs> when you're yeah. learning how to perspective draw you're learning how to observe the objects right and Scott uh, mentioned this yesterday you're like if you don't really understand how objects work mechanically you're mm -hmm. you're not going to be a good sketcher or like the best one right so for me that's that's why you need to learn how to perspective draw. But in a way, you need to learn how to depict a three-dimensional image. You need to understand how how it's formed so that you can actually represent it, whether it's in perspective or whether it's in 3D. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts because you were like very philosophical around like even the paper <laughs> being 3D. <laughs> it is, yeah. Very passionate about that. Um, yeah, I, I think the whole... The whole sketching process, learning in school, is it builds a lot of character. Um, a lot of that is just learning the discipline of how to manage your time, knowing how long it takes to sketch something, um, and how you're going to manage your time to deliver the 20 pages, you know, eight hours later in the morning. So um, there's a lot of character building to that. Um, it, but you're absolutely right. Like it does. If you construct everything manually, you really get to see how it's how it's made. I took Scott Robertson's class in first term, and I, I did all the calculating the shadows and everything manually. Um, I, I do wonder if sketching will be around in industrial design forever, because it is it is kind of repetitive. Um, and I can see in the future, if, say if we have a, we don't even have headsets anymore, we just have holograms projecting on our table, and we're just we're like the, the girl in Blade Runner who's just coming up with all these shapes by twisting a few knobs. I kind of wonder if that's going to be the future, like a hundred years later. You know, I'm totally open to that. 
So she doesn't. She didn't have to learn how to sketch anything. She just, she just makes it all happen. So yeah. I'm wondering if, you know, maybe without sketching, you're doing other things like you're just researching objects, or you, you, you know, there's always that comparison about um, sketching versus modeling. Where, what do you what do you do if you're in a boardroom and you have to sketch up the concept in front of people? Like, what if that boardroom has a holographic projector and we have we can intersect a bunch of primitive shapes in front of them, you know, but if, but if we don't actually need sketching in the future, just, just some thoughts. Or is that sketching, right? What is, What's that sketching? A sketch? what is a sketch? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a funny comment here from David Holt. Uh, they don't even teach handwriting in school right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Um, we have one question here that's interesting. How do you pitch Gravity Sketch to skeptical management? Numbers. Um, if, so the other, a couple months ago, I had maybe one day to, to work on a sketch, comp, work on a sketch competition at work for a, for a vehicle. And um, everyone had, everyone involved in the project had like, I'll, I'll wait to do it. I had like one day because I'm really working on Razor. I had to, this was for another platform. And they were like, throw in sketches if you can. And I had one day to do it. So I went to Gravity Sketch, used the hidden line technique, came up with two concepts, and then filled a, a four foot by eight foot wall of sketches just from just from screenshots of the angles of those. And um, one of those got picked for focus group selection. Um, and then I then I told the boss like, by the way, that's all three D. He's like, well, <laughs> so I don't know. Just let let the work speak for speak for itself, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. I want to bring I want to bring Ali to the um, to the um, to the conversation because he's probably going to have some questions. So Ali, I'll oh, there you go. Oh. Um, yeah, I'll bring you in. Hey, Ali. Hey. Hey, everyone. Hey, Ali. I'll uh, just do a quick introduction. Um, I'm Ali Musabi. I'm an automotive design consultant at Gravity Sketch. Michael, you definitely inspired me in more ways than one today with your talk. Um, I really, really uh, liked your line library that you had, where you were just grabbing the tailored lines and Kind of creating your uh your, your really cool vehicle there um i did have one question so you mentioned that you use artificial intelligence uh mm -hmm. in your process did you, are you using that to create the background and then putting the asset in that background yep i haven't had good luck creating actual vehicles yet um but i also haven't put that much effort into pursuing that um but just just making the background um, within a few minutes has been such a powerful way to work. And it's also given me ideas. Like there was one, there was one piece I did. I don't have it here where the background was so nuts that I had to change the vehicle to match the background. <laughs> so the background almost influenced it. Um, cause the a vehicle should be able to work in its environment. So I did a bunch of changes to it. So That's yeah, super as cool. far as I've with it. Have you, have you taken your vehicles and use AI as an ideation tool yet? I haven't had good luck with it. So yeah, same. Still, same. still working on it. Part of it's like, I don't, I don't want to admit it a machine. I don't want to admit a machine can do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, another part of your process that, uh, that I really enjoyed seeing, and you did mention Scott Robertson as well, because I remember when I was a student, I would watch his technique where he would take like a 20% Copic marker and loosely draw a shape and then go in with uh, a fine like pen and kind of create objects yeah. from those shapes. And that's kind of what you showed today in Gravity Sketch when you were kind of blasting in with a like a light gray volume tool to kind of get that proportion inside the panels that you had. So that was really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't do that in Blender. I can only do it in Gravity because Gravity is fast enough just with the, having your wrists to control angles like that, those little microsecond um, time saves really add up. Yeah, you can you can achieve those happy accidents, you know, a little oh, bit. For sure. 
you know, and that's yeah, yeah. where great content art lives. It's like those little accidents that you can, discoveries that you can uh, have when you when you do when you use like the volume tool or just yeah. the, with the with a big brush. Yeah. Um, thank you for the the razor, by the way, as well. I actually got the chance to um, get behind the wheel of one of those, and uh, they're a blast. So thank you. Sweet. <laughs> My the razor I showed was done by Tristan Hips. The, the one that I did is coming out soon, so stay tuned. Okay. Cool. I, well, I did I did some of the one I showed, but I have like three vehicles coming out in the in the near future, so <laughs> stay that's tuned. That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah.